Welcome to the second of a three episode series outlining the Fort Madison School District ad hoc committee master planning process. If you've not watched episode one, we ask that you pause this episode and go watch the previous episode entitled Where We Are Now. That episode is important to outline the current conditions of the Fort Madison Community School District and why this process is needed now. As introduced in episode one, this master planning process is broken into three distinct phases. This video will review where we want to go, where we define a vision for the future and imagine what is possible. We are going to explore the basis of successful future-focused learning environments. It begins with understanding of the needed skills to be successful in our ever-changing world. Next, we will discuss programs and opportunities to best develop and refine those skills. And lastly, how can facilities support these programs to ensure students are given the best educational opportunities? To understand our facility needs, we must first review the previous models of education, which is why our current buildings function how they do. When these facilities were designed, education was developed under what is referred to as the factory model of education. Students moved class to class as if they were on a production line, and the goal of that was not about innovation or engagement, but rather to create a labor force of skilled and unskilled labor. There were some learners that excelled in this model and became leaders. Most people fell into the middle, which was where both skilled and unskilled laborers were. And then there were the extras that didn't fit the model and in turn could not succeed. When looking at employment opportunities when this model was thriving, you can see it was supporting the type of workforce needed at the time. Major portions of the population were in manufacturing or wholesale and retail trade, with very few in fields of finance, communication, etc. Today, these employment opportunities have almost flipped with business, professional services, and even jobs that didn't exist 20 years ago leading the pack. This change is also reflected in the types of work that are happening in the modern workplace. Non-routine manual type labor is dropping off, where interactive and analytic non-routine types of work, which are heavily reliant on problem solving, are much more prevalent. Another way to see this are the types of tasks necessary to perform those work types. Complex communication and expert thinking are overarching constants. Routine efforts such as manual or thinking exercise are becoming less utilized for modern types of work. In order to support necessary skills, the programs and curriculum in schools have also changed dramatically since the era when these facilities were designed and constructed. In social studies, a curriculum that was once complete with Western and American history has now expanded to include a wide variety of world history and governmental classes, as well as into the realms of economics, sociology, and psychology. Shifting to business education, no longer are we teaching transcription or shorthand, but rather multimedia, web design, and computer applications. The last example, special education, is the greatest change from the past. Over the past 60 years, we have gained a much greater understanding of students at every place in the spectrum of learning, and that to be successful, we as an educational institution must meet the students where they are. Special education classes became a required offering in 1975, and these facilities did not include these very important programs in their designs. This complex combination of a much different workforce for which we prepare our students, the skills we aim to teach, and the curriculum we teach is why our buildings no longer function like they once did. We must look to create more modern spaces, more flexible, more collaborative, more specialized for our students' varied needs. Now this may cause you to pause and ask, do school facilities actually affect academic outcomes? The answer to that is a clear yes. In addition to aspects such as daylighting and environmental comfort, which have been proven to improve student performance, a student's ability to be active can have a dramatic impact as well. It has been shown that physically active students are 20% more likely to earn an A, leads to increases in standardized test scores, and it reduces teachers' time spent managing kids' behavior by up to 21%. This is just one of the factors that could be improved through facilities. We're now going to explore some important aspects of a future-focused learning environment. These features can be attributed to five key components. The fact that learning is no longer optional, all students are expected to be supported and perform up to a standard. No longer is it acceptable to leave the other learners as shown on the original bell curve. To accomplish this, it is necessary to meet the needs of every child. Beyond special education, hands-on learning, quiet spaces, and the ability to socialize are aspects that support students and allow them to flourish. Educators must aim to engage students in their learning. No longer do teachers act as a sage on the stage lecturing to a room of students. 
successful students are now active participants. This is enhanced through anywhere, anytime education, both true in the school building where breakout areas or common areas sometimes support students best work, but also the fact that through technology, learning can happen anywhere. And lastly, all education programs and facilities must support the four C's of future focused learners, collaboration, communication, creativity, and critical thinking. Future focused environments should provide superior daylighting and have proper acoustics throughout. They must be safe and secure, allowing both the administrators and students to focus on the tasks at hand and not on if their environment is safe. Facilities must support hands-on learning, not only in industrial tech spaces, but also in spaces like science, art, and STEM education. Spaces must be student-centered, focus on how they support the learner, not just the efficiency of fitting students into the building. The ability to easily convert spaces provides for flexibility of programs and for future needs. And ultimately, the goal is creating an environment of collaboration and connection amongst educators, students, and the community. So what do we want for Fort Madison schools? The work to this point has highlighted some key areas that a master plan needs to address. All students pre-K through 12 should be impacted with upgrades to their learning environment. The design must look to provide modern learning opportunities such as computer science and hands-on learning to provide opportunities for students to excel in an ever-changing world. We must create enhancements to student-focused spaces that allow for flexibility, communication, and collaboration among students and teachers. It's important to provide better support for the pre-kindergarten programs as both a community and district need. And lastly, the goal of a facility alignment to fully support and maximize teachers' ability to deliver top of the line programs and education to the students of Fort Madison Community Schools. We hope you found this video informative and we invite you to continue on to our next episode, episode three, where we will explore how do we get there, exploring the currently proposed master plan scenario for Fort Madison Schools. For more information and to gain access to the upcoming community engagement panel sessions, please visit www.fmcsd.org forward slash facility dash planning.